Hey guys, welcome to the Masters Monday, our favorite day of the week. We get to bring you fun information all about fitness, and today we actually have a special treat. Ordinarily, we'd be interviewing someone. Right, and we've had some ballers for sure the yeah. last four weeks, but... Today we actually have another baller, and it happens to be Chan Ganaway. He's going to come and really deliver some information about personal training and how you can be elite in your game, right? And all the things that we've seen over the plus 50 years of experience that we have, there's been quite a few interesting personal training techniques. And uh, yeah, so he's going to share some of that, how you can be your best. So I'm going to let Chan get away, take over. So she's going to bounce in just about two minutes, but, um, but Carrie and I, are the master's fitness and a lot of our focus has to do with 40 plus training and programming 40 plus age group which is the master's age group um, and so what we're going to talk about today is incredibly important for that group but it is incredibly important for the personal trainers of the world in general um, to me what I'm going to talk about today are non-negotiable items truly non-negotiable this is the way that you train the human body period from A to Z, zero to 100, whatever you want to call it. And that's what we're going to get into today for about 25 minutes or so. So with that being said, I'm going to step out. Chan Yenaway is going to she's, step in. She's the IT director. Yeah. <laughs> so she is going to make sure that we have me up on the top and then the bulk of the contents because we're going to work off slides today. This is, I didn't want to do just verbal or audio. Um, so I really wanted to give slides. So in case you guys are there and you want to snap a screenshot of a slide that makes sense to you or you're, you know, then you'll Get have ready. an opportunity. Yeah. Or take notes. But here we go. But boom. All right. And wait for it. All right, everybody. So listen, the intro is nice, but it is time to get into the meat of the matter here. Uh, the podcast today is really about elite training and programming. And yes, I'm Chan Ganaway. I wanted to put my email up there for you and then the website and where you can find some of our work, some of our videos, some of our podcasts. Uh, it's all here on the page, Chan at themastersfitness.com and then the website right there www.themastersfitness.com and YouTube channel, IG, Facebook, all under the same name, The Masters Fitness. All right, you boys and girls ready? So this is a passionate subject for me. Um, in the 23 years, it, it makes sense to run through the bio just so you know where I'm coming from and where my experience brings me to today and this subject that I'm passionate about. Well, 23 years, I've spent training, managing, and educating in the fitness industry. Um, really, my, my most amazing memories, I spent six years in California with a company called Club One Fitness in Northern California for six years and really incredibly opened my eyes um, because I got to hang and mingle with some of the absolute elite trainers and educators in the world uh, based out of San Francisco, um, San Diego, LA. And so it was really easy and accessible to those guys. Then I worked for Midtown Athletic Club, which the corporate office is based out of Chicago. Worked for those guys for two years in Florida, actually, at a Midtown Athletic Club as a master trainer. Equinox Health Club for three years as personal training manager, tier three trainer there in uh, kind of North Miami Beach. And then Orange Theory Fitness as the corporate fitness and education director for five years. And then I had a three additional years working as a regional uh, manager uh, on the fitness side of things and the education side of things and also an owner, part owner uh, of a studio. And then ACE uh, and NASM, I've been an education provider for those guys off and on uh, for about 20 years. So 2000, 2001 was when I first, you know, had my courses approved and was really strongly presenting them in Northern California with the 160 trainers or so that I was responsible for there. Uh, most recently, Grit Boxing, based out of Manhattan, New York City. So those of you guys from New York, what's up? And a uh, year and five months, uh, really just uh, started last two Decembers ago, coming forward uh, and built the curriculum 
uh, and the workouts from absolute scratch and what a crazy experience this was. So the programming piece of managing trainers, educating trainers, building curriculum from zero has really given me a really great view um, of what is an elite training session from start to finish. So here we go, game. <clears throat> So I have truly seen just about everything you can see when it comes to client, uh, private client training. We're not talking about small groups, although some of this may apply. We're really talking about the individual one-on-one -on -one sessions, and this could be virtual, and we'll get to that in a second, or just private training live in person. And so what some of the stuff I've seen, if I can be candid and funny for a minute here, um, when trainers go off and they get a BOSU certification, Okay, what do you think I've been seeing for years on Monday? That trainer is doing all BOSU with their clients. Whether they're ready or not, whether it makes sense for the goal or not, um, I would re regularly see, um, it's like, ooh, a new toy. And so we would all kind of go to that toy. And then there's a bias style of training with a lot of trainers and it's very normal. Um, they train a certain way, um, whether they're a power athlete or an endurance athlete, they tend to kind of push the client into their box, not necessarily what the box uh, is needed for the client. So there's a very specific box for that client. Sometimes we shove our box into their box. Um, too much load for the client's abilities. I, I see this regularly, it's very easy to see. Uh, if you have the eyes and the, and the kind of the vision for it, where you can kind of see the breakdowns uh, in their posture, their torso, whatever it may be, but the client just doesn't have the ability to load heavy. So it's, it's the aggressive style of training. And then there could be 15 bullet points here, but then the no cool down or basically no flexibility component to speak of, whether it be pre-workout or post-workout. So those are the concerns, all right? So those are the concerns. Uh, there's also, I've seen, mind-blowingly wonderful training. Um, I've hired and just sat back and watched amazing trainers my entire career that I have learned from and shared information with. And so that's also been an, an absolutely a positive aspect of my career. I'm very motivated to educate fitness trainers who want to be considered and viewed as elite fitness professionals. And that's really what this is gonna be about today is if you are already, if you're on your way, or if you're at the beginning of that curve and you're in your second year of a career as a fitness trainer, uh, this can help you. There will be some nuggets for sure that you can take away. Um, my motivation on this subject in particular for this time in history, okay, would be the result of really a missed opportunity, um, no fault of anybody's other than the dang virus that we're having to deal with, but the opportunity at the Idea World Convention, um, there was a lot of what we're gonna go over today that was going to be in that lecture on Saturday that I was presenting at the Idea World Convention in Anaheim in July. And then also the new expanded virtual training business, which is obviously, everybody knows it's just booming exponentially. And with really quick booms like that, I hope that you guys can just put on your manager hat for a minute or your owner hat for a minute. That's pretty scary, right? So you have tens of thousands, uh, hundreds of thousands of, of fitness professionals now going virtual and not really having that connection or maybe not having the, the right vision to be able to see the client appropriately. They may not even have the right tools to train with. So the expansion of that, the missed opportunity to be able to come back and give some of the information that I was gonna give in that lecture is kind of important to me. And then I really ultimately want the clients and I also want the trainer from a liability point of view from the client succeeding. I want all you guys to really have successful sessions that really do have a blueprint uh, for success. And then we'll talk about how you make sure the client knows how smart you are. Okay, that is a very important piece of running your business is let these guys know why you do what you do and why you made the choice and why you added this to the program. Those are really important aspects to confirm that those guys made a great purchase in working with you, okay? So now let's get to step one. There's gonna be four steps today. And this is step one and it is the client ready state. 
And, and Carrie is so wonderful at this. Um, in the first three to five minutes uh, of her virtual sessions that I witness uh, here, um, she really, there's, there's no training dialogue at all. It, it's how are you doing? How's the family? How's the new shiny car? Did the kid win their soccer game? I mean, it's a really relaxed, just chill out, relax. Believe me, two minutes out of the 45 minutes or two minutes out of the 60 minute session absolutely should be mandatory for you to just take a moment, chill out, relax your shoulders, and let's get to know what's happening in their lives for the last couple of days or the last week. I think that's really, really crucial because you want that personal connection. The personal connection is going to keep them with you long term. Yes, the training programs. Yes, them getting results. Yes and yes. But believe me, they don't have some type of personal connection with you or think that you genuinely care about their lives outside of your training session. That could make it a little bit easier for them to start flipping trainers. Okay. And I want you guys to have them long time. What is their energy level on a scale one to 10? Big question. Overall attitude of the client. Do they greet you with, hey man, what's up? Glad to see you. I've been so ready for the session. Or is it, hey, what's up? You know, I mean, you need to pay attention to the overall attitude because that needs to be addressed right then and there. And then you go into the session, understand why their attitude's low or high. Sleep over the last two days, crucially important. We're getting sleep articles thrown in our face. I've never seen so much information going out about the importance of sleep as I have in 2020. It's huge. Even going back to 2019, a lot of fitness journals are putting energy and articles and professionals into sleep. Pre-workout nutrition and hydration levels. Check in. Are they working off of a 13-hour fast and now they're training with you? Do they understand the difference between complex carbohydrates pre-workout and the big protein shake that they take pre-workout and start complaining of a stomach ache 20 minutes in, which I've witnessed. I cannot tell you how many times I've witnessed this. Okay, so do they understand the difference? What's actually gonna fuel the workout and be usable versus what's gonna bog them down and, and reduce their energy levels, which would be a high protein pre-workout. So physical status, are they sore from a previous workout? With or without you? Did they go on a 30 mile bike ride and they haven't done that in three years and they can barely walk and now they're coming to your session? Minor injuries, yesterday's workout, soreness levels, all that stuff needs to be asked. This is mandatory stuff. If you're going to set up the ready state of your client, all of the above that I just mentioned may result in program adjustments in real time. And what I mean by that is there may be two or three exercises in the program that you wrote that's got 13 exercises in it for that day. Two or three of them may need to go bye-bye. Or you unload those exercises. Now it's a body weight exercise versus an 80-pound additional load to the body. So all these can dictate the program in real time making adjustments right then and there. Pretty easy to do if you have a lot of experience, maybe not so easy to do if you're fairly new to the game, but I'm just letting you know those things are gonna happen and we have to go out there and get the information and learn how to make those adjustments, okay? And then all of the above as well should give you enough information to score their overall ready state on a scale of one to 10. You gathered all the information I just covered for the last two minutes. Are they a seven? Are they an eight? Are they a nine? Are they a 10? Are they a four? That matters in how you're going to run them through that workout and the details. And I can only take 30 seconds on this, but the details of this could be fatigue, sore client. You've got four plyometric exercises with additional load to the body schedule for that day. Those are pulled. Those are out. Take care of that client. Here's the key to your business. Make sure they know why you pulled them out. I can't have you breaking down on the landing piece or the decelerating piece and put you at higher risk for injury. So we're going to slow things down today and work a little bit body weight, mobility, movement. Okay. You're going to sweat your tail off, but we're going to tweak this. I'll get you next. I'll get you in three days though. I'll beat you up in three days. So those are the kinds of conversations and observations that I feel very strongly about in step one, the client ready state. How are we doing so far, gang? We're good. All right, let's go to step two. Warm up science. Okay. Um, it takes a lot of knowledge, education, information to prepare an elite, smart, and appropriate warm up process. It is a process. It might be a, a three minute process, 
a five minute process. Uh, it's not unlike me to do an eight to 10 minute warm up before the client even grabs the first exercise of the meat of the program. Okay. So in order you guys, and, and just hang with me here. If you have the ability or access, excuse me, to a foam roller of some type, self myofascial release is step one to increase blood flow and warmth to the area, whether it be the lats, the hip flexors, the hamstrings, the calves, lower back, whatever it may be. Okay. There's a little, there's some neurological stimulus there as well, but it's about warmth. It's about joint mobility increasing, joint flexibility increasing. If it's not so much focused on a joint that you're trying to loosen up and to increase, such as like the calves would increase ankle mobility, then it's about increasing blood flow and temperature to a certain muscle group, like the hip flexor, for example. Then you could move into static stretching. Now you're like, wait, this is pre-workout warm-up and you're talking about static stretching? Yes, I'm talking about static stretching because sometimes there are dysfunctionally tight muscles, okay? For example, poor posture, like really poor posture. You got it? Visualized? That client needs some static stretching. Dynamic stretching is, they're not ready yet. We'll get there in about 90 seconds, but they're not ready for dynamic stretching. We need to allow the muscle to have time, 20 to 30 seconds. If they're in a dysfunctionally tight muscle group or a joint that is compacted and dysfunctional, we have to include static stretching in the pre-workout. Yes, okay? Then you move into possibly, I, don't, I do this about maybe a third of the time with my clients in pre-workout, and that's an active isolated stretch, which is kind of the hybrid between a static holding stretch with no movement, and then there's the dynamic movements of stretching, right, where we're doing leg swings for hip flexors. It's kind of the happy middle, all right? There's usually a, a one to two second hold, and then you release it, and you're using agonist and antagonist methodology to kind of get the muscles to stretch for two seconds release and you'll usually go around about 10 rounds of that i'm just thinking of the hamstring for example as one to kind of easily visualize you got a yoga strap around your foot you're on your back and you're pulling your leg up into a nice stretch two seconds using your hip flexors and quads to increase range of motion and then you release two seconds on one second off 10 rounds of it active isolated stretch that can be really useful um, again for maybe a dysfunctionally tight uh, area such as hamstrings which my god what is it with clients hamstrings it's like they're this long anybody anybody okay nuts and then the dynamic movements which is the big movements right torso rotation we're gonna you know alternate a nice chest opener shoulder opener and usually i will include no less than five dynamic warm-up movements in my warm-up for my clients. Now, a dynamic movement, don't ever think that that's only for elite athletes or intermediate level athletes. A dynamic uh, stretch or dynamic flexibility or movement can be very gentle, super gentle, right? A leg swing can be like this, or a leg swing can be really aggressive and there's walking with it and we're traveling and it can be everything in between. So dynamic movements, are, are beautiful, okay? Because now you're gonna get that stretch reflex piece, which is great. Uh, I love it because you're preparing them to move. And there's a little goofy saying that I like to use over the last couple of years is move to move, right? Move to get ready to move. Uh, and that's why static stretching completely fell off the radar about 10, 15 years ago pre-workout because we realized that some some level of static stretching which is really all we were incorporating at one point um, for general clients really kind of put the muscle to sleep and we didn't want that because we were about to ask them to move sleepy muscle getting ready to move doesn't make any sense so then there was that big shift towards moving stretches if, if you will and then the cardio warm-up i've watched this more time than i ever want to think about Hi, Joe, go get on a treadmill for five minutes and I'll see you in five. What, what is that? What the hell is that? You know, sagittal plane, walked in with tight muscles. I don't know if they're looser or not. I don't know if they're warm or not. And then we're going to be working all different planes in the, in the program. 
and we just send them off to the treadmill and we bring them back with their tight little calves and their tight tighter hip flexors and their poor posture and nothing was given attention that really needed it is their body in good alignment ready for a great training session i'm telling you the answer is no if we're just sending them off to the treadmill for five minutes and saying adios i'll see you in five and next thing you know we're doing traveling lunges with dumbbells in our hands bad idea uh, give these guys a, a moment to stimulate neuromuscular coordination, uh, dynamic warm-up. Let them do all those things. And remember, it can be light to really aggressive and complex, you know, depending on your athlete. Okay? So in order, the self-myofascial release with some type of foam roller, static stretching, active isolated stretching, which is kind of the moving, holding stretch using the agonist-antagonist approach, dynamic movements, all three planes. We got to work frontal, we got to work sagittal, and we got to work rotation and try to get the entire body ready for a multi planar training experience. Well, how do you do that? Dynamic movements in all three planes. That's how you do it. Sounds pretty simple, but I'm telling you, I rarely see this. You know, I've been in gyms a lot of years uh, and it, you just don't see it that much. And it's just, I don't know if it's, you know, kind of autopilot. For the trainers, they kind of get on autopilot, and I've been there, been there. I've not been proud of 100% of my sessions in 23 years. Um, but when I'm on my A game, I do address 100% of everything I'm telling you guys right now, okay? So let's move on to step three, the meat of the program. So the first thing I think we need to consider before we start putting pen to paper or we're getting on our laptop is to understand if, if they're in a phase of training um, or is it just a buffet style programming? You know what I mean? And, and I'm not poo poo and buffet style of programming. Sometimes a client just has this very diverse, fun program and they're doing a little bit of power and a little bit of strength and maybe they're working their abs for a hundred reps and that's more endurance and, and that's okay. That's fine. Um, to me, that would be more for a kind of an intermediate elite level client who can just handle everything you throw at them and they're good to go. Um, but, I, but I really do 80 to 90% of the time, I'm always uh, able to identify the phase of training that the client's in. Now the examples could be a strength phase, they're going through a hit phase where you're really working a lot of body weight, dynamic movements, heart rates way up, um, you know, burpee, speed skaters. I mean, we're just crushing the heart rate. But that is for very select few group of clients who can handle that from a coordination point of view and, and not get injured and handle it well. Uh, they could be in a weight loss phase, muscle endurance phase, power, stabilization. Maybe it's just they hired you for 30 days to learn movement. It's a movement education phase. That's it. And then we get the post rehab sometimes when they're released from the physical therapist and, and they're ready for, you know, to hit the gym with you with some certain protocols, of course. If it's a virtual session, does the client have the tools for their goal? Do the tools they have available to them equal and match the goal that they're trying to achieve? Right now, if you're doing a bunch of virtual training, the chances are no. They probably don't have all the tools they need. So then we go deeper, and I'm gonna tease you guys at the end um, to possibly present a two hour workshop, or excuse me, lecture here, just like this, uh, in a couple of weeks, if you guys want it. But here's what I think when I read that, okay? Do they have the tools? If they don't necessarily have the tools, but they're trying to you know, continue to build strength, then you've gotta now work off of ratios. You've got to totally put some energy into the eccentric, taking longer, the concentric phase of a rep, taking longer, time under tension has to come into play because they don't have the heavier weights for eight reps that you would love to put them with. So that's just one tiny, tiny little sample, but they may or may not have the tools. If they do have the tools, phenomenal, amazing. I know Carrie and I are just, we just salivate with jealousy when we see all these wonderful garage gyms that people have. We're like, we're dying over here because we're, we're in a condo on the second floor and our gym in the condo shut down. So we're like, dang, it's, it's brutal. All right, work to recovery. If you're gonna put some real energy and education into the meat of the program, kind of that middle 80% of the program, you have to address and have a system mandatory of work to recovery. 
It's science. Is it three to one? Is it one to one? Is it one to two? Is it one to three? Work to recovery. That has to be part of the program. I'll give you some basic guidelines. If they're a novice client, fairly unfit, fairly uncoordinated, they fatigue easy, okay? They need you, right? You're gonna have potentially longer recovery times or the load and the intensity of the exercise is actually quite low and they may not need virtually any recovery. So you have to think the intensity of each set and the level of clients, novice, intermediate, elite is and should dictate your work to recovery ratios a strength program could have as much as three to four times the recovery as the work so i work for 30 seconds i recover for 90 seconds to two minutes as an example that's a really smart program how many trainers do you know actually have a client recover 90 seconds to two minutes not many you know why because they're anxious they feel like they got to keep the client moving, keep them excited, keep them engaged. Okay, we'll have them drop and do a core exercise. Do something. But that recovery is needed if we're going to come back to a heavy chest press, for example. It's just science of ATP and recovery. Recent article in May, June edition of the Idea Fitness Journal. Uh, there was a, I loved it. I absolutely loved it. I learned something. Um, I used to do this a lot with endurance training because I competed in so many triathlons and long running races and bike races and all that in, in my day. Um, so we always tapered. It was part of the thing. And there was usually a, at least a seven day taper and sometimes a two week taper if we were getting ready to compete in the sport of triathlon or bike racing or running, particularly the marathon type stuff. But let me read some stuff on it. I think it's really interesting. Tapering for resistance training. Okay. Dr. Lynn Kravitz, uh, Jake Theus, and Zachary Mang, and Jake Theus, by the way, if it's Tice or Thice, I'm so sorry, but it is T-H-E-I-S, Zachary Mang and Dr. Lynn Kravitz have this wonderful article in um, the journal I just mentioned, Tapering for Resistance Training. And Dr. Lynn Kravitz, going back to kind of, I'm gonna back up about uh, 15 minutes, it says fitness pros should be aware of their stress levels, uh, absolutely, because if the client is overstressed, his or her body will not fully adapt to the training stimulus. So that's going back to the warm up ready state part. Now let's talk about the tapering piece real quick. Tapering is basically lowering your volume for a one to two week period, about 20 to 40%. So let's say that a client's had a really aggressive, tough, challenging 30 day program with you. Take weeks five and six and pull them back about 20 to 40%. Only working no more than 75% of a one rep max. Just an example, you can read the, the whole article in the May-June Idea uh, Fitness Journal that just came out, and it's, it's a really good read. But fitness tapering uh, for resistance training, specifically for your client, what an interesting idea. And there's a whole list of improvements, like a whole list of the benefits of this, okay? But generally speaking, it's lowering the volume 20 to 40%, okay? So good read. Okay, here we go, guys. Step four, cool down flexibility. Mine and Carrie's concerning observations uh, over the last 50 plus years combined, um, little to no focus on high level post-workout processes, okay? And that's managing a, a, a absolute ton of trainers. Stretching for five to 10 seconds per muscle group instead of what they were trained on, which is 20 to 30 seconds, okay? Lowering the heart and head below the hips after an extremely strong finish. So imagine a, a real big finish where you challenge them with reverse lunge to bicep curl right into five burpees, four rounds, two and a half minutes, their heart rate's at 155. And literally within 30 seconds, we got them bent over doing a standing hamstring stretch. I, I just, the, the trainer knows better. They know better. It's an unconscious kind of on cruise control autopilot way of being. And it can't happen, not on your watch, right? So we gotta be smart. The stretching must be relative to the program just executed. Super basic example, if the program was 70% lower body that day, the post-workout and cool down should include 70% lower body stretches, super basic. Static stretching is the rule, but also self-myofascial release and some light dynamic could be good here as well, 
okay? Must be a teaching moment. Take the flexibility, three minutes, four minutes, everything's cool and calm, to teach. Teach them. Dialogue should be setting up enthusiasm for the next session. You are running a business after all. Personally, I give out homework to my clients. Usually it's based on flexibility and nutrition, the homework, okay? Deal? So that's a big piece of it, but I gotta tell you that it must match, it must be patient, and it's gotta be smart, all right? Now, the podcast, uh, we're wrapping this thing up, but listen, chan at themastersfitness.com if you have any questions. Themastersfitness.com if you wanna go to the website and check us out. YouTube channel, IG, Facebook, all by the same name, The Masters Fitness. Now, here's a challenge for you before I read off. Come on in here, Carrie. So listen, I wanna challenge you guys. If we can get 30 individual requests on this subject matter to expand it to a two hour lecture, two and a half hour lecture, I'll go as long as you guys are, have tolerance for, okay? Um, I will host a two hour training on this subject. If we can get 30 individual requests from the, the listeners over the next seven days or so. All right, we'll dive deeper in and further explain the details of building out an elite program. The fun part, you get to send me some basic info of your client and we'll even work off of some of their stories, okay, to build the program using all the information that you guys just heard over the last 20, 25 minutes. Okay, so that's the deal. Um, listen, these slides are available in the podcast episode and uh, the description, uh, email request for them at chan at themastersfitness.com. So if you have any requests, you want the notes, you want the you know eight slides that we use, I'll send these suckers right to you. I'm good. I really want, you know, it's funny, 10 trainers send me an email. They all have 10 clients. I just impacted potentially and we together, okay, me and you, we just impacted 100 clients. A 1,000 trainers send a request, we just impacted 10,000 people. So this is what we want. We want everybody to have a nice system and to really be smart on this subject, okay, gang? So that's it. Find us on the YouTube channel, Instagram, Facebook, subscribe, like, follow, share. Particularly that's the YouTube channel, which yes. is gonna build up pretty heavily this summer. We're gonna put a lot of energy into the YouTube channel this summer uh, with some series, you know, summer fee-based, most of it's complimentary, but it's gonna be a great summer for our YouTube channel. All right, and thank you very much, and uh, we will see you next time. Bye -bye.